welcome to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, I have a pleasure of introducing my colleague, Charles Plant. Um, he wanted me to start with stating that uh, he's a very boring guy. He's an accountant. Uh, he is also an um, unreformed entrepreneur. He uh, acted as a CEO and a CFO of several successful software companies. Charles is the kind of guy who would ask simple, naive questions, but the really hard one, uh, the questions that everybody should have answers for if they really want to be in business, seriously. Um, so he was a CEO also of a company called Synamics, a telecom software firm that he co-founded. Uh, Synamics provided uh, mass calling platforms to telcos and um, had a number of um, important business partners like uh, Lucent, Cable Wireless, Bell Canada, Rogers, and others. Um, Charles also was a management consultant, investment banker, and um, worked with, uh, in an accounting firm. Uh, so he worked with over 100 companies, and he's seen uh, many stages of company development. He was a guy who gave money to companies. So when he'll be talking about what VCs want, he speaks really from the knowledge, uh, from many years of experience. Charles, welcome. Thanks, Veronica, very much. I'm sorry Tony's not here because, you know, it, Veronica introduced me as boring, which is absolutely quite correct. You can all leave now if you want to. You know I'm an accountant. You have very low expectations, and that's good. And the great thing about Tony is that he goes on and on forever. So you have at least half a lecture of Tony and half a lecture from me. So tonight I want to get across this idea of what VCs want. And, you know, you, you're all out there. Anybody hope someday to get VC money? Think that they might look for it? Okay, a lot think they might look for it, only a few hope they might get it. So you've got the right idea so far. So what we want to do is say, you know, you want money. Very simple, okay? What you want with that money, though, is you're hoping that you'll get the money and the VC will go away and leave you alone. Is that correct? That it's a simple process and you'll get the money in the bank. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. You really have to understand what VCs want if you want to sell yourselves to them. So that's what we're trying to do tonight, trying to prepare you for a, big, a bit better understanding of what VCs are looking for so that when you actually talk to them, you seem to be able to meet their needs in some way. So you want money. VCs want big money. They want big money back. And, and I have to thank Andy Haig, who selected all these pictures today. Uh, he did a very good job. I know I, I ha sort of got you off speed at the very beginning, thinking that the first picture was a little boring and the others might be a little bit better. So VCs want big money. And you know, in business, you've got to understand your target market. And Peter Evans probably talked to you about understanding your target market. And uh, there are a variety of other speakers who really get across that idea of you have to understand the needs of your target market. Well, at the same time as you have to understand your target market for your product, or your technology, or your service, or whatever it is, you have to understand the target market of the VC. You have to understand what the VC's needs are so that you can develop and, and present your potential in a way that meets those VC's needs. So um, you've got to understand the customer, their buying behavior, what they're buying, and not knowing what VC's really want is one of the mistakes that almost all companies make when they start approaching VCs. They go up to a VC, you know, and I'm doing this, and I've got this, I want this amount of money, et cetera, and it's not resonating with the VC. You have to be able to understand the VC's language, understand their needs, and be able to show that you understand them and can meet them from the very first meeting you have with them. So companies don't get funded 95% of the time just because they don't meet the VC's needs. It's not because they're not a good company. It's not because they don't have good technology or a good, uh, you know, good people behind it. It's just that they don't meet the VC's needs. So you've got to treat a VC like a prospective customer. So let's look at the VC as a customer and figure out what the VC has to do to make money. The VC business is about kissing frogs. 
Okay, we have a very attractive frog up here on the screen, slightly pixelated. But the idea of kissing frogs is that you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you're going to find a prince. So a VC might, and you can ask Tony about this, because Tony will tell you exactly how many companies he talked to in uh, many years of, of dealing with and trying to put money into companies, how many we're talking to in the Investment Accelerator Fund. And you can use a ratio that you're going to talk to about 1,000 companies in order to be able to make about 10 investments. That's a phenomenal number. So right off the bat, if you get further than a first meeting with a VC, you're doing extremely well. But the VC is going to look at 1,000 companies. Of those 10 investments that the VC makes, only two will do extremely well. So the VC's batting average is, you know, when you look at percentages, extremely low. You might have two doing extremely well, four doing okay, and four going out of business, something like that. And if a VC can do that, they can build a successful portfolio. But uh, the rest will be right off. So if you look at, even if you get funded by a VC, you're going to be very lucky if you're in that two out of 10. So that's a lot of what goes into, and the reason behind v, well, why VCs do certain things when they're approaching companies. So from 1,000 companies, you might get, as a VC, one star. That's it. You have to look at all those companies to find one really good performer. And that's why you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find the prince. So a good example of this is uh, YouTube and Sequoia. Sequoia is a, a major uh, name in the VC industry, one of the preeminent firms, has done a lot of really good deals. And YouTube was one of the deals that Sequoia did an amazing job on. So Sequoia was um, uh, sold YouTube to Google for $1.65 billion. Phenomenal number by any stretch of the imagination. Sequoia had initially invested $11.5 million into YouTube. Okay? Now, they didn't get that whole uh, 1.65 billion, but they owned 30% of YouTube when it was finally sold. Okay? So far, so good. So they turned $11.5 million into uh, something like $495 million, a 43 times return. But now remember, for every one of the, of the YouTubes out there, there are nine that don't get $495 million for investing 11. And that's the problem with the VC portfolio, is that um, you have to make a certain number of investments to get a certain return. So if you look at the typical VC portfolio, YouTube, CanooTube, uh, SnafuTube, IgloTube, uh, KazooTube, and MSNBC, you, you can see that one of the 10 did well, okay? And it did incredibly well. It got a 1,000% internal rate of return. The rest of them returned nothing. So when you look at the overall portfolio, because a VC has to return money to investors, if you look at the overall portfolio, the internal rate of return of the overall portfolio is only somewhere around 100%. Now I say only around somewhere around 100%, that is phenomenally good. But in order to get that return, they had to fail nine times to succeed once. It's a tremendous problem they face. And if you look at the statistics for VC returns in the United States, the top quarter of VCs earn a return on average of 25%. The rest of them are earning less than 25%. In fact, there's a significant problem with many of them raising funds because they're only earn, able to earn a 15% return. And people go, you know, for the risk-reward trade-off, that's not particularly good. If you look at Canada, the VC firms in Canada as a whole earn a return in the low ones. The labor-sponsored venture capital firms, and you can check the papers for these statistics, are earning negative returns over the years. Because trying to find that one company out of a thousand is a really complex business. And when you're approaching the VC, you think, okay, the VC wants to earn 25% returns, 50% returns. Well, I can deliver 50% returns. That, unfortunately, is not good enough. And what this means for you most of the time is that the VCs say no. 
Now, this is an ad here. We're plugging vcware.com. You can actually go and get a T-shirt to wear to your next VC meeting that says uh, no in many words on it. The thing about being a VC is that in order to make that phenomenal return, everything that they invest in has to have that 1,000% potential. So it's not good enough that a particular um, investment be able to return 100%. That's no good. That won't earn them the regular returns because of the failure rate. They have to get the one incredibly successful one to be able to balance off all the rest, to be able to earn returns so that they can get money from investors, so that they can charge management expenses and take home millions of dollars even before they're successful. But that's another story entirely. So you've got to balance out the ones that are going to fail with the one that's going to succeed. So when they look at you, they're not looking for a company that's going to do well. They don't want a company that can double every year. That's not, I mean, that's 100% return. But that doesn't do it for them. They need the company that's going to be kick-ass, out of the ballpark, phenomenal returns to balance everything off. And the problem is there aren't that many around. So they go looking for it. So if you present a common sense company that's going to do well and succeed and earn profits, that's not going to earn them the return. They're not going to be interested in investing in you. So I want to turn now to something completely different. So if we can. I'm glad to say that I've got the go-ahead to lend you the money you require, yes? Uh, we will, of course, want as security the deeds of your house, of your aunt's house, of your second cousin's house, of your wife's parents' house, and of your granny's bungalow. And uh, we will, in addition, need a controlling interest in your new company, uh, unrestricted access to your private bank account, uh, the deposit in our vaults of your three children as hostages, and a full legal indemnity against any acts of embezzlement carried out against you by any members of our staff during the normal course of their duties. <laughs> No, I'm afraid we couldn't accept your dog instead of your youngest child. We would like to suggest a brand new scheme of ours under which 51% of both your dog and your wife pass to us in the event of your suffering a serious accident. <laughs> Fine, no, not at all. Nice to do business with you. Uh, Miss Godfrey, could you send in Mr. Ford, please? Now, where's that dictionary? Ah, oh, yes, here we are. Oh, yeah. In our life. <clears throat> In a night. Go in. Ah, um, Mr. Ford, isn't it? That's all right, yes. How do you do? I'm a merchant banker. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Uh... Um, I forget my name at the moment, but I am a merchant banker. I <laughs> uh, wondered whether you'd like to contribute to the orphan's home. Well, I don't want to show my hand too early, but actually here at Slater Nazi, we are quite keen to get into orphans, you know. Uh, Developing market and all that. What sort of son did you have in mind? Well, you're a rich man. Yes, I am. Yes, yes. <laughs> very, very rich. Quite phenomenally wealthy, yes. I do. I do earn the most startling quantities of cash, yes. Quite right. You're rather a smart young lad, aren't you? To do with someone like you to feed the pad of my horse. Very smart. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now, you were saying I'm, I'm, I'm very, 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 very rich. So, um, how about a pound? A pound, yes, I see. Now, uh, this loan would be secured uh, by the... It's not, it's not a loan, sir. What? It's not a loan. <laughs> ah. Uh, you get one of these, sir. It's a bit small for a share certificate, isn't it? Look, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think I'd better run this over to our legal department. If you could possibly pop back on you, Friday... Do you, we... do you have to do that? Couldn't you just give me the pound? Yes, but you, you see, I don't know what it's for. Well, it's for the orphans. Yes. It's a gift. A what? <laughs> a, a gift. Oh, a gift! A tax dodge! No, 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 no. No, 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 I don't understand. Um, can you just explain exactly what you want? Well, I want you to give me a pound, and then I go away and give it to the orphans. Yes. <laughs> well, that's it. 
No, 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 I don't follow this at all. I mean, I'm, I don't want to seem stupid, but it looks to me as though I'm a pound down on the whole deal. Oh, yes, you are. I am. Well, what is my incentive to give you the pound? Well, the incentive is to make the orphans happy. Happy? <laughs> You're quite sure you've got this right. <laughs> yes, lots of people give me money. What, just like that? Oh, yes, must be sick. <laughs> Uh, I don't suppose you could give me a list of their names and addresses, could you? <laughs> no, I'll just go up to them in the street and ask. Good Lord! That's the most exciting new idea I've heard in years. It's, it's so simple, it's brilliant! Well, if that idea of yours isn't worth a pound, I'd like to know what is. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> the only trouble is, you gave me the idea before I'd given you the pound. And that's not good business. Isn't it? No, I'm afraid it isn't. So, um, off you go. <laughs> nice to do business with you. Anyway. And off we go again. Uh, Miss Godfrey, uh, could you send in the pantomime horses, please? <laughs> Okay, back to boring. So, you've gotten past that stage. You understand what VCs are looking for. You've brought them a proposition. You've talked to them 62 times. You've waited seven months for an answer. And they finally get to the point that you're all looking for. And that is the term sheet. So this is what happens if they like you. And that's what we want to explore tonight is what is a term sheet. What's it mean to you? What does it contain in it? Because what happens frequently is that people are heading along the path of getting money from a VC, and they come to the term sheet, and they look at it in absolute horror, absolute shock at what it actually contains. And what actually the VC wants in return is so shocking to some people that they immediately start sputtering at the VC, saying, you can't be asking for things like this, which immediately makes the VC wonder, well, what have I really gotten myself into? What am I investing in? Somebody who doesn't understand the basic terms that a venture capitalist is looking for. So what we want to do here is say, what's the mindset of a VC? Why are they thinking this way? And uh, what exactly is a term sheet? So we're into words now. Um, a term sheet is simply an offer to invest in a company. Very simplest terms, it's a non-binding offer, meaning this is sort of like what we think we might like to do if everything else goes OK. Uh, it's tabled by all types of investors. So angels use term sheets, typically shorter and less onerous than venture capitalists do. But venture capitalists all use term sheets. Strategic investors use term sheets. It's just a common phrase, a common mechanism that's used in the industry. But fundamentally, it outlines the basic points of agreement it isn't the whole deal. The whole deal is several inches thick. The term sheet is about 10 pages thick, and it only says basically what we're going to look for, the principles upon which uh, a binding contract will be based. Furthermore, it's not the final document on the subject. You haven't really gotten as far as you think you've gotten when you get a term sheet. This is now down to the brass tacks, the nitty gritty, etc. Because of that, term sheets are negotiable. But it's important to know how far you can go in negotiating them when you're approaching the term sheet. So the first thing is that the term sheet contains some basic terms. It starts off with basic, you know, non-threatening language, today's date, uh, what the amount we're going to invest, who we are, the names of the investors, the price of the deal, the capital structure, et cetera. So those are the main points. Now, at this point in time, most people look up and go, OK, this is fine. You know, I know you're going to buy certain types of shares, and we're going we're to do business on this basis. So far, so good. And that's where the simplicity really ends. Because the first thing you've got to be aware, aware of is this whole issue of valuation. Now, has anybody here watched um, well, Dragon's Den on TV? What sort of valuations do they put on companies? Sort of like, oh, you, you know, $50,000, you might be worth $100,000, uh, et cetera. 
Dragon's Den do their investing in a completely different way than most venture capitalists do. For venture capitalists, valuation is an art, and they had to approach it like an art because most entrepreneurs overvalue what they've done in their business. And there are certain magic numbers, like you've worked for, uh, for two years, you haven't earned any pay, therefore the business must be worth $2 million. And if you've worked for only a year, it must be worth a million dollars. So the VCs have developed a way of getting around that structure and around how you think of the value of your business by saying, oh yeah, if it all works out in the end, yes, then today that was the value. But if it doesn't work out in the end, then today that's not the value. So they approach valuation like an art, uh, not a science. It's, there are no standard ways of doing it. Everyone does something a little different. They look to public companies for comparables. They look to what they've paid before for companies. They use such techniques as discounted cash flow because a finance professor from a long ago told them that they had to use that. They use standard multiples because that's what other people seem to use. They throw that all in the air because none of those really work for pre-revenue companies. How do you have a revenue multiple when your revenue is zero? How do you even have a multiple that makes sense when your revenue is under a million dollars? So the first thing they do is they turn to the company's growth forecast. Now, some of you are doing the, uh, um, the contest, the Entrepreneurship 101 um, contest, right? Are you producing cash flow forecasts and forecasts of your business for that? I'm not sure if you have to. But this is usually what the forecasts look like. And it's amazing when you see entrepreneurs. The first thing, to be an entrepreneur, you have to be positive. You have to be, you know, think positively about your future. So they all produce the hockey stick forecast. And it all starts with no revenue and all of a sudden ramps to millions of dollars of revenue in a very short period of time. There was one I looked at, the last one I looked at a couple of weeks ago, uh, had a conversation with the entrepreneur and his forecast was to do something in the neighborhood of $16 million in his first year of revenue. So last year he earned no revenue, this year he was going to make $16 million, the following year $50 million. That's what venture capitalists see. Now, in reality, it probably takes even the most successful companies three, four, five years to get to $10 million. So you, your first thing is when you meet the venture capitalists, you will naturally have enormously positive calculations of what your future potential is. They don't believe them anyway. Okay? You can use them and analyze them in any way you want. They're, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to say, oh, that doesn't make sense. We're going to rationalize that forecast. We're going to say, okay, based on our experience, if you are one of the 10 that is successful, and this isn't, this isn't for the nine that aren't going to be successful, this is if you are one of the 10, we're going to take that forecast down significantly from your big line and make a much lower, more gradual ramp, because that's realistic. One of the reasons you can't go from zero to 16 million is you can't hire people fast enough to get from zero to 16 million in, in a year. No matter how much you model it, no matter what you do, there is some relationship with the client. And unless you're somebody like Plenty of Fish, you know of Plenty of Fish, the website? Some of you might be afraid to admit you know of Plenty of Fish because it's a dating site. I don't know, if you have a chance to read the story of Plenty of Fish, it's phenomenal. The individual who owns it uh, makes personally $10 million a year. He works one hour a day and has no employees. Okay? Absolutely phenomenal. Now, he doesn't need venture capital money. So he's the exception, really, that, that beats the role. But for everybody else, there's more modest assumptions that gets you to some rationalized level of expected results over a period of time. So what the VC says is, OK, over a period of time, with that revenue forecast, we need a million dollars of seed money. We need uh, $5 million of Series A money. We need $15 million of Series C and or B. And finally, we get $25 million of, of Series C before we go public. So we need to raise all this money. And the money has to last a certain period of time. So they look at an investment in stages. They say, OK, as the company is growing, we're going to increase the amount that we pay. As long as it keeps on growing and meets expectations, we'll increase the amount that's going to be paid because we as the first investors are going to be investing in future rounds as well. Otherwise, the, the system doesn't work for the venture capitalists. So they figure out what degree of risk they're taking. Now, the earlier the round they go in, the more risk. 
Seems logical, farther from realization, uh, less known about the customer, et cetera. So they're measuring their degree of risk. From that, they determine what investment multiple they need. So we talked about the multiple in, uh, in YouTube's acquisition, at sale by Sequoia. They're looking and saying, okay, at this degree of risk, I need, let's say, a 15 times multiple on my money, on my first money in. And in order to get that, I have to see that when the exit comes, it's going to come at a certain price. So the, all the math has to work out for the long term and each stage in which they're investing. So they simply determine the investment multiple they need, figure out how much money you need, and work backwards through this formula to figure out exactly what you're worth at this period of time. Now notice that that is if everything goes well. So they're planning for everything to go well at this stage. The minute things don't go well, what do you think happens to the, next, the price of the next round? And we're back to the same old risk again. The next round comes down at even less money potentially, less dollars per share, and um, you've got a problem with that formula going forward. So what they talk about and what is essential in this term sheet is they have arrived at some pre-money value. And a pre-money value is what your business is worth right now without their money in it. Seems logical? They add their money, and it becomes what's called post-money value. Okay? Now, this is what they're going to reflect in and how they're going to calculate the share price. Because they use that post-money value to then say, okay, the post, you've, you've got a business, we'll say it's worth a million, we're putting in four million, the post-money value is five, we get 80%, you get 20%. So far, so good? Easy math, et cetera? So they're working all of these things out to figure out the price per share in order to build enterprise value. So what is essentially happening is they're paying money in at the seed A, the series A, series B, et cetera, and the price, the real underlying value of the company is increasing on the green line. So according to the formula, they're actually overpaying when they come in at the beginning in the thought that because of this formula, they will underpay, and because it's going to grow so rapidly, it'll be worth more in the end. Now, that's a bit of a complex thing to get through in five seconds in a presentation, but understanding that, that this is the first in a long series of investments that is needed to get you to public markets or to get you sold is essential to know that it really doesn't matter what you do now about negotiating the price. There's only so much room you've got because you've got so many rounds to go. It's better to concentrate on making the company successful over the long term than it is worrying about what price you're going to get from the VCs and how much your business is worth now. So that's the first sticky point that people get to when they reach a term sheet is, I mean, is my business only worth that much? Don't worry about that because if you're all successful, it'll be worth a phenomenal amount in the future. It's actually worth nothing right now because no one would buy it in the state it's in. And to get VCs to put money in, you've got to put it in in a certain structure. And that structure is the next thing about the deal that disturbs people. It's preferred shares. So you, as a founder of a business, typically hold common shares. And common shares, I mean, people generally understand they, uh, they represent ownership of the organization, the ability to vote their shares, the ability to receive dividends. Preferred shares are slightly different. And preferred shares are a vehicle that is designed to protect the venture capitalist uh, so that they can get their money out before you do. And that's the first psychological problem that you'll run into with a term sheet, is the venture capitalist wants to get money out before you do. They also, not only do they want to get their money out, they want to vote those shares. So while many companies that are public have non-voting preferred shares, the preferred share structure has been set up by VCs so that they can actually vote their shares and have uh, as many votes as those shares indicate, and from then on are really in effective control of the corporation. That's what's unknown to many um, entrepreneurs. So VC comes in and says, I want preferred shares. The second thing they typically say is they want an assignment of all the intellectual property. Many uh, entrepreneurs set up the most amazing structures 
for ownership of intellectual property. And it's interesting to watch. They have subsidiaries. They, they've started another company, and they license the technology only over from one to the other. They do strange things with uh, familial relationships so that they'll, they'll give the technology company to a spouse and retain the operating company so that there are tax benefits associated with that. VCs don't want that. Because ultimately, the VCs are buying two things. They're buying the technology, and they're buying the people. And they know they can replace the people. They can't replace the technology. So they want to make sure that all of the intellectual property is in their package, completely assigned, irrevocable, belonging to the company in whole. And so that's one of the major things they're going to ask for. The next thing is, Andy picked a beautiful picture here of an employee. Well, that's what employees look like nowadays, I'm told. Um, they're going to say, OK, you've got shares. We've got shares. The next thing is we want everybody else to have shares too. And that's to get everybody singing on the same song sheet. You know, it's difficult to attract uh, younger employees to companies when they have the potential of security at major firms. They have the potential of job growth and all of those things. So you have to have a little sweetener. You have to make sure everybody is on the same page and working towards the same result. And that same result is ownership of the company, and phenomenal amount of money when the company actually goes, uh, actually goes public or gets sold. Now, this whole idea cropped up many years ago when um, Lotus uh, went uh, public. Did anybody here have uh, sh uh, used Lotus products, Lotus Notes? There are some people using Lotus Notes. Some people might remember Lotus 1, 2, 3, which was a phenomenally good software package that I really loved. But the only problem is it wouldn't integrate with Word, so everybody dropped it. But the world woke up one day when Lotus went public because all sorts of people, secretaries included, became millionaires on that day. And they scratched their heads and said, oh, you know, there might be something to this. And from then on, the concept of employee ownership of a company that is a, a young technology company is essential for its success. So, VCs say, not good enough that we get in, that you get in. We want to make sure everybody is rewarded on some basis for cooperation. So they create employee share ownership plans. And what they normally say is, we're going to allocate a certain percentage of the company notionally to the employees, somewhere, let's say, between 15 and 20 percent. That percentage will depend upon the degree of risk, how early on the company is, et cetera. And they also notionally say, we're going to need maybe a new CEO, maybe four vice presidents, and there the CEO that we bring in might get 5% options, and the vice presidents might get 2%. But they figure all that out ahead of time, and they create a vehicle called an employee stock ownership plan that allows everybody to uh, participate in the success of the company. The board of directors in the future will need to approve any changes in that, but uh, we haven't gotten to those provisions yet. Next thing they'll do is they'll say, OK, you know our preferred shares that we just bought? Well, we get dividends on them. We, you don't have to pay them right now. You can pay them in the future. But they're going to accumulate. So those, those dividends are going to accumulate steadily over time. It's usually a relatively low percentage, maybe 5 percentage dividend that's going to come on those preferred shares. But mindful of the fact that uh, they want their money back, and you remember they want big money, one of the ways of doing that is by adding in all sorts of provisions. And the first provision is that they're going to get dividends at some point in time. So even before you get money out from your common shares, they're going to get money out and they're going to get dividends. The second thing is a concept called liquidity preference or liquidation preference. Now, this is particularly irksome to uh, entrepreneurs. Because the concept here is that the VC gets the VC's money out before anybody else does. So you start a company, you sell it, uh, VCs invest $5 million, you sell it for $10 million, the first $5 million that comes out is a one-time liquidity preference. So up here you can see LP being liquidity preference. So if you do extremely well, and the, and the Venture capitalists own 50% of the company. They get their liquidity preference out, and then you split the rest. Oh, and by the way, they also get their dividends out first, too. 
So they get liquidity preference, their dividends, and then you split the rest. Now, that works extremely well under certain circumstances. And where it works is if you have a screaming success. And it won't matter what the liquidity preference is in a screaming success, because their share ownership percentage will make it worth more uh, than the liquidity preference, and therefore they'll just convert their shares. But in the situations where things don't work out, the mid-range companies, we talked about the four companies that do okay, what happens in the four companies that do okay is that the founder gets screwed. Essentially, the venture capitalist gets their money out first, gets accrued dividends first, very little money left over. Who else is going to participate in that? Well, there's the employee stock ownership plan too, isn't it? So the employees share something, and then people start splitting the remainder of the pie. So one of the things that the VC has done is said, we're not going to argue about valuation now. But if you produce results that you promised me, everything will be fine. If you don't produce the results, I'm going to get my money back first. So it's going to be OK for me. It's just not going to be very nice for you. So that's the whole concept. And you will see that liquidation preference mentioned in one of the first key terms of any term sheet. In the really crazy days of 1999, 2000, you had liquidity preferences of two and three times because the valuations were stupid. Nowadays, a liquidity preference of about one times is reasonable because valuations are slightly more reasonable. So there are more rights and privileges than you could ever imagine that the VC gets. So one of the first things the VC gets is uh, an automatic conversion. So on certain events, the VC shares can automatically convert into uh, common stock, sale of the company, things like that other things they can elect. Another major thing that they get, which is a very sneaky thing that you've got to watch out for, is what's called anti-dilution clauses. Meaning, we put money in, we own 80% of the company. If we need another round of money and we're, not, we're raising it at less dollars per share than the first round, then our percentage doesn't go down, yours does. So that's an anti-dilution clause. So they've protected themselves if the thing doesn't work. They protected themselves if they need more money and it's not working when they need more money because their percentage stays the same and yours starts shrinking. These are all designed to really, and most of this document is designed to protect the downside. If everything goes extremely well, none of this kicks in. If it starts going south, you've got problems that are going to kick in. Another thing they'll look for is uh, redemption. Redemption will say that they are able to ask for their money back in a certain period of time, five to seven years, let's say. So the VC can come in and say, here's the money. It's going into preferred shares. We're getting dividends. We're getting a liquidity preference. And by the way, at some point in time, we can ask for our money back. What they want then is to be able to say, you know, it's over. You haven't done a good job here. We control the company now. And they do that by saying, you either pay us back or we take over the company. And that's the more rights and privileges than you can ever imagine. So money's in there. Now you've got shareholders. And it's not as if they're just regular people sitting around the table. Those shareholders have more rights and privileges than you can ever imagine. Uh, holders of 60% of the preferred shares, and you know, of course, that the preferred shares are all the venture capitalist shares. So holders of 60% of those shares must agree to any amendment of your charter, any amendment of your bylaws, any sale of assets, any reclassification of shares, any liquidation of the company, issuance of senior shares, uh, amendment of preferred shares, a merger. Basically, if you want to move or do anything with the structure of the company, the VCs have to agree. It is no longer your company to run. It is their company to approve how you run it. So you have to work very closely with the VC in understanding their needs and not try and do anything that's particularly uh, onerous to them. They must also agree to all sorts of other matters, payment of dividends, any material change in employee agreements, uh, any material change in the business. If you want to change the business you're in, you've got to get the VCs to agree. Any long non-arm's length transactions, the creation of any employee stock ownership plans, any major thing that you want to do to the structure, the VCs must approve of, 60%. Now, if you have two or three VCs in there, you might theoretically think that it's possible to get one or two to play off against a third, but they don't work that way. 
VCs typically all work together. The minute they start working apart, they'll never do another deal together again. So that asking for 60% approval is like asking for 100% approval. You now need the VC's approval to do anything that you want to do. So they also ask for uh, a shareholders agreement. And that shareholders agreement starts specifying all of these things. Who has what rights? Who has what privileges? Many companies, when they start out, are producing annual financial statements. They might know what's in their bank account on a monthly basis. They might be able to calculate how much revenue they've gotten. But they aren't producing a volume of information. And any reasonable VC is going to ask for financial statements on a regular basis. They're going to ask for monthly financial statements. They're going to ask for special quarterly financial statements analyzed in a certain way. They're going to ask for annual audit of financial statements. And they're going to sit down and review those things with you on a regular basis. There are some good things about that, as opposed to um, uh, you know, it being all bad. One of it is you get your act together from a financial point of view. And you're forced to look at your results on a regular basis. And that's not a bad thing. It's just that for many companies, getting used to that type of of activity is particularly problemsome. So they want a board of directors. You might now have a board. And if you're young, you might have a board of three people. And you might have a good friend who's a lawyer on the board. They want a board uh, made up in a certain way. And typically, when they go in in the very beginning, they want a board of five people. And those five people are going to be two of them two of you, so two of the founders, and one fifth party who is mutually agreed upon, which means that the VC gets to suggest the person, and you get to say, OK, that's a good person to put on the board. Okay? So if you look right now, you've got all sorts of agreements that say that the VCs get to control what's going on. And you now have a board of directors that you don't control. You've got two VCs on the board and one of their friends. Now, of course, because the friend does deals with the VCs most of the time or has been financed in the past, who do you think they're going to support? They're going to be supporting the VCs. So effectively, under this circumstance, while you still think you run the company on a day-to-day -day basis, you've got a board of directors who is, com who is predominantly not a friendly family member. Not to say that they're not friendly in the long, time, in the long term. You're also going to have board meetings. You're going to have a very attractive, intelligent board that uh, wants to meet on a regular basis. Uh, regular meetings must be called, but it really isn't a meeting unless the VCs are there. You might used to have a meeting that's impromptu and you decide to do something, sign a few pieces of paper. It doesn't work that way. If the VC is not there, it doesn't count as a meeting. And at that meeting, the VC's got more things that they get to approve. They get to approve the financial statements. They get to approve quarterly and annual budgets. They approve capital expenditures. And typically, with young companies, they put a limit. And they say, OK, if it's budgeted, you can spend up to 50000 If it's not budgeted, you can't spend more than 5000 if, it, if it's over 50000 and budgeted, you still need our approval to spend it. So you now have the chance of having them to approve what you're spending your money on. They get to approve your annual business plans. They get to approve who is being hired as key employees. They get to, to approve key employee of compensation and bonuses, entering into any major contracts. You get the theme here? The VCs have effective control of your business now. It's no longer your business. Now, theoretically, you might you know, have, a, have a problem with that. But effectively, they've put in so much money that they have the right to be able to say what goes on in your business, how you operate, what they control. They're going to ask for other things. They're going to ask for key employee agreements. So um, they're going to say that all key employees, particularly the founder, have to sign off on non-compete, non-solicit agreements, meaning they can't go and compete with the company. They can't go and ask uh, if they leave the company. They can't go and uh, ask previous clients for business. They can't solicit employees of the company to bring them over to their new business. So all of these things are, are ways of tying down not just the shareholders and the owners, but the key employees of the organization. And the way they get the key employees to sign this is by offering the employee stock ownership plan. So there's always a little bit of quid pro quo. So if you want option on 2 3% of the company, you have to agree to abide by these agreements. The next thing is stock restriction agreements. 
And stock restriction agreements are interesting because they put everybody in the same boat. You've now brought in a VC. It means that you just can't go willy-nilly sell your shares to anybody. The likelihood that someone would want to buy them in those circumstances is slim anyway, but you can't, say, decide to sell your shares without their approval. Everybody's in the same boat. There are provisions like drag-along and tag-along provisions that say, if you're going to do something, or if we're going to do something, we have the ability to drag you along in that agreement. So if we want to sell, we can require you to sell at the same time. If, um, if we decide to do something and we don't elect to drag you along, you can elect to tag along in those circumstances as well. So you get drag along, tag along, so that everybody is now in one big boat and they're all heading in the same direction with the captain and the steering and everybody else sitting on the sidelines quipping and saying, this is how you do it, this is how you do it. You can't all of a sudden very easily break up a company because of these stock restriction agreements. So once you get through all of this, all of these major conditions, there are all sorts of, uh, of legalese weasel words. And the weasel words are really in there to say, and they could easily say it much simpler, if we, they could say, if we don't like anything we see until we've signed the final agreement, that's it, game's over. But instead they put all sorts of terms in there that say, you know, we have to get a satisfactory legal opinion, we have to do due diligence where we're going to check out and look at everything you've told us to determine whether it's correct. We have to uh, look at all prior agreements, make sure there are waivers from prior agreements that are in place. We have to get approval of our committees, which is really just like saying we have to approve ourselves, but we claim that there's a committee doing some approving. You have to make representations and warranties that say that what you've said is truthful or not, and if it's not, we can get our money back. Uh, there has to be no material adverse change in the business on an ongoing basis. So all of these things to say, we're giving you the term sheet with all these onerous things, but if anything slips up in the next two months before we close the deal, we're getting out of the deal through one of these mechanisms, through these so-called weasel words. Another interesting facet of um, these agreements is that for the venture capitalist, the agreement is not exclusive. But for you, it's an exclusive agreement. So once a VC ponies up and says, we want to invest in you, you can't be going out and talking to other people to get them to invest. They have exclusivity over that transaction for um, as long as they want and as long as you agree within the term sheet itself. And that is designed specifically to protect them from you shopping the deal. And so in days that are particularly hot, you know, you'll go get an offer from somebody and you'll wander around the table and look to the next VC and say, you know, this guy gave us an offer of $2 a share, you know, we'd be pleased to do business with you at $2.25. But you can't do that. VC does not allow you to shop the deal to somebody else during that time period. And in fact, there are major penalties quite often in these deals, including you paying them money, which you don't have, if you shop the deal. So they really want to tie you up not only once they get the money in, but they're tying you up from the minute you sign that term sheet. You'll get a deadline for acceptance. Okay? Usually some reasonable period of time. They don't force you. It's a complex transaction. You might have other shareholders. And this is where you can say, I want to negotiate some terms. It's very difficult to start negotiating terms um, later on in the deal when you're actually signing papers and signing all shareholder agreements and things like that, it's better off that if you've got particular terms in that deal that you negotiate them then. The difficult thing to negotiate is the structure and the price. One thing you can negotiate is the liquidity preference. So if you feel that it's getting a little high, you might have some small room in liquidity preference. You might, but that is arguing to them that you think the deal's going to go bad. Because if you think the deal's going to go well, they're going to say, well, the liquidity preference doesn't matter if it goes well. But you can make some room there. You can, you can make some changes to the employee stock ownership plans. You can make some changes to how boards are formed and how the decision making, for instance, you get to propose the person instead of they proposing the person. And those are the small things. Basically, though, the major items of the structure aren't changeable. You can't do much about that. So, 
The first thing you should do when you get a term sheet is actually go and consult your lawyer. Go find some lawyer, not a regular lawyer, not a real estate lawyer, someone who's dealt with VC term sheets who can say, yeah, this is a reasonable term, this is an unreasonable term, we can get them to move here. First thing to do, go and consult your lawyer. And watch out what you ask for. Because if you ask for the wrong thing, you could be sending a signal to the VC that A, this is someone I don't want to do business with, or B, this is someone I can't trust, or C, this is someone who doesn't learn from the process. Those are all very important things for a venture capitalist in that process of negotiation. Once you've signed the term sheet, uh, it goes on to be papered in two inch thick paper so that uh, the deal is all properly done with the lawyers, et cetera. During that phase, there are small, very small things that can be negotiated, structure and language and things like that. But fundamentally, the deal is done from your side, but it's not done from the VC's side. They have the chance still to back out and do anything they want. And so selling to them, you've got to understand that you might have the order, but you haven't done the delivery yet. And the delivery is, is what counts. Now, all of these, you might, you might think in saying, the first time you see a term sheet, you might go, ah, oh, you know, horrible bunch of provisions. This is terrible. But there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is the golden rule. The man with the gold rules. The VC has the cash. You don't have the cash. The only way you can get to rule is that if you can get, if you have such a hot business that there are VCs fighting over the deal, then you have the chance to rule. Facebook had the chance to rule when it got Microsoft's money in. That how many uh, millions of dollars and some inordinate valuation that they got? They were able to rule because everybody wanted into that game. Otherwise, the man with the goal rules. Now, all of this sounds particularly onerous. And it's really only onerous when things go bad. None of you want to get a VC into your company if things are going to go bad. Is that correct? You only want to get a VC into the company because things are going to go well. None of this really is a problem as long as the company is doing well. So when you look at the deal from the VC, you've really got to shrug your shoulders. Go after a few minor points and say, you know, it doesn't matter all of these things because you're not going to do anything to us if we're doing well. You're going to leave us alone, and we're going to do extremely well all on our own. You don't, uh, you don't have to worry. If you start arguing the negative side, it means you're thinking that things are going to go poorly. And they immediately start getting worried about how poor things could go and why you're protecting the downside instead of just saying, OK, you know, we're in bed together. Let's deal with the upside. Now, there are some VCs around where it really doesn't matter even what the terms say. And one of them is potentially the Investment Accelerator Fund. Because the Investment Accelerator Fund, if you know of that and have heard of that from Tony, is financed by the government of Ontario. And the government of Ontario, because they're financing it, isn't going to allow anyone to do something that is particularly problematic, like the IAF do something problematic, to put a company out of business. They're not going to use those terms to use a bludgeon over you because it would look bad in the press. Uh, there was an organization called Innovations Ontario, and they were maybe the second VC I got money from sometime in the late 80s. And I looked at their deal, and it looked just like this. And I said, oh, that's no problem. I don't care what they say in their deal, because they're not going to ever do anything like that, even if things go bad. Because there's no way that anyone will let the government put a company out of business. The repercussions in the press are just too much. Second is somebody like Business Development Bank. The Business Development Bank isn't going to go around putting people out of business because it's just bad for their business as a whole. So the only ones you really have to worry about are the venture capitalists that are private, privately funded, because they actually will do something to recover money or to put a stop loss position in or to be able to affect control of a company. But you only have to worry about that if things are going to go particularly badly. You don't have to worry about that if things are going to go well. And finally, that's why they call it vulture capital. The vulture doesn't kill its prey. It just feeds on the dead. And so all of these terms make the venture capitalists look like a vulture to the investment, uh, to the entrepreneurial community, when in actual fact, none of it matters as long as you do extremely well. Are there any questions? <laughs> well, 
Well, there's good reason for that. I've, I've, unfortunately, in Canada, there aren't many situations where venture capital deals have gone particularly well. They, you can probably on, you know, add, put, list them all on one sheet of paper. For the other 90% of companies, 95% of the companies invested in venture capitals, it hasn't gone particularly well. So you're better off to know what the potential problems are before you address them. If you still think you've got something that's a barn burner, that's going to earn you a thousand percent a year return, then the VC is the right place to go because there's no one better at supporting you and giving you money and giving you advice and giving you connections than the VC when you're doing well. And there's no one you'd rather be in with, no one you'd less rather be in with if you're doing poorly. Well, uh, how can I say this nicely? Typically, the private investor has much better market knowledge and better skills and better contacts. So if you're a successful company, you'd rather have an investment from a private venture capitalist. In the initial stages, though, they're not as usually as prepared to take the risks that a government investor will. So that if you're at a stage where you can't get venture capital money, but believe that you could get it if you got over a hump, then the place to go is to a government fund like the Investment Accelerator Fund. But if it's a, if it's a business that's based on sort of interacting with the government, would the government not be a better place to start? Because when you're talking about connections... They don't care about that. It's usually not a criteria. Yep? <laughs> That's a good question. And it's complex. To me, uh, there are two major things. You have to have an incredibly good potential market, and you have to be incredibly good business people. So in terms of the market, you have to address four factors. That there's, you recognize that somebody somewhere has some pain that needs solving. Secondly, that... Um, there is value to your solution that is well above the value that others bring to the table, and you can protect that value through patents. Thirdly, you have to be a high priority purchase opportunity for your target market, and there have to be a lot of them that could buy. Then you get to the business acumen, you've got to have operational excellence, business acumen, and domain expertise. And if you can put that all together, and most companies think they can, that's why a thousand companies winnow its way down to ten, because everybody, when they look at them themselves, say, well, you know, I've got all of those things. But when you look at what a really great company is compared to one that thinks it has all those things, there is a big difference, and it's complex. So there's no criteria, per se. It's an evaluation. There isn't automatic, you meet these three things, you get your money. Other questions? Yep. You know, that's a hard thing to do, to go to the U.S. First, as a, as a seed stage. In fact, there are very few U.S. investors who will invest in a Canadian seed stage deal. They have, because of the complexity for the Americans of investing in Canada. For instance, when they get their money back, they get it as a regular income unless they set up special trusts and offshore accounts and offshore companies, so that they only like to do big deals. And big money shouldn't go into small, small companies. So you should look to uh, an American investor in something like a B round if you can. So you get your seed round locally from angels or friendly government type of venture capital. You get your A round from local venture capitalists, preferably a number of them. You get your B round from maybe the old venture investors plus an American. That would be the time when you're already well along the way. They can see the traction because they also want to come and visit you all the time. And, you know, that's another problem in location. But I got, um, I split around between Vengrowth in Toronto and Arch Venture Partners in um, Chicago. And that worked out extremely well in terms of getting them. They, we were at the stage that that was appropriate. They got along very well together. They liked to play together. 
It's a very nice sandbox. No, and because no, they wouldn't stay away from it. The government, when you say government, it is a separate fund that is managed like a fund, like a seed fund. It's just been financed by the government. So there isn't any money that you actually get from the government. And people won't stay away from them just because the money is there. In fact, the investment accelerator fund money is very friendly to follow on VC rounds. Its structure is quite simple and contemplates additional rounds and knows that it can't pony up again so that it makes it easy to bring in other investors. Um, notionally, they're supposed to invest in deals up to half a million dollars and maybe a dozen a year. So I can't remember how many we've got right now. I think 13 have closed and five more are closing. The, uh, some deals will only get 250,000. Some deals might get 100,000, depending what they need to get them over a hump in order to move them along in the road. Um, I think there was a second half of your question and I can't remember what it was now. That was, okay. Yep. Uh, just back to the Canada US question. Uh, so let's say I have a technology that uh, I, can't, I can't patent in Canada, but I can patent in the US. Uh, that would be an odd one. It was, it, I'm, in a, I'm in a situation to use the, the, the treatment, the disease treatment. Uh, oh, so it's not, the, they won't patent those things. Okay, yeah. Oh, don't worry about Canada. Your sales aren't going to be here anyway. Right. <laughs> Sorry. That was, uh, so, you know, it only matters if you could patent in the U.S., even to Canadian VCs. Okay? They don't care what happens in Canada. In fact, what frequently companies do is they decide to have a local market and a bench head, you know, and then progress to the States. It doesn't work. Buyers in Canada buy for different reasons than Americans. You're better off ignoring Canada totally and starting a company and start selling to the U.S. from day one. But, but Canadian VCs would get involved. Yep, totally. <coughs> Other questions? Yep. You know, funnily enough, it doesn't matter who the organization is, but I tell people when they start to try and raise money from a VC that it takes six to 12 months, about nine months on average. And there are reasons for that. It takes a while to get ready. Then it takes a while to start introducing yourself. And usually the VC wants to know you for a while to see if you meet your promises. Because you'll say, you'll meet them in May and say, you know, by September we'll have done this. They'll want to meet you again in September to see if you actually did that because then they're going to gauge, us, gauge you as to whether you can meet your promises because that'll indicate what their future is going to be like with you. So they want to know you for a while. They want to evaluate you. They're going to want to offer a term sheet and then it's going to take a few months to close that term sheet. So if you do it in six months, you've done an incredible job. It's not unexpected to take 12, but nine would be about reasonable. And it doesn't matter who it is. Other questions, or should we call it a night? Thank you very much.